why we have a quorum, why don't we start? I'll um, turn to El Toss and do the introductions of our guests tonight. Okay, tonight uh, we're hearing from Minuteman um, and the uh, three people before you, Sarah Montague, who's the Arlington representative on the Minuteman School Committee. Uh, Kevin Mahoney is the acting superintendent of schools. Give us a presentation. And Nikki, I can't remember your last name. That's it, Andrea. Okay. So, uh, Kevin, whoever you want to start. Sure. Great. Thank you. Is there a. Um... Unfortunately, there's not, but I will gladly click through for you. Oh, okay. Great. That's funny. Um, well, thank you. Thank you very much for having us here. Um, as we begin on slide two, you can see as we prepare our, our, our budget, we do try and keep in mind uh, where our budget priorities are and how they reflect our values and that of course, providing the necessary resources for our students and staff to be successful. We also like to uh, go over uh, what some of the accomplishments of some of the Allington students that are that are here at me. I mean, you'll see on slide three, those accomplishments. Nikki, why don't you run through a couple of those? Yeah, us? so um, we're happy to report class of 2023 valedictorian, um, Alex Hazelbush. Um, he was in our engineering program and, and took me a, a wonderful highlight for Arlington. Um, in graduation, 22 graduates uh, went on to two or four year colleges. Three have apprenticeships in their field and one heading into the military. Uh, currently 215 students in all of Minuteman's uh, major programs, and 27 students out on co-op, 20, 25 seniors and two juniors. And um, athletic achievements uh, running through soccer, volleyball, and basketball. As well as the Skills USA uh, National Champions, um, the, the brothers Dean Gavin and John O'Brien last year, which was certainly a great accomplishment, very proud. Uh, before we proceed, should we continue through the entire presentation and then uh, answer questions, or do people want to ask questions while we move along? Uh, why don't we? Why don't you pause where wherever there's a good place, okay. and then we'll ask questions. Let people ask questions, and then you can continue on. That sounds fine. Thank you very much. Let's move on to slide four, please. What you'll see is a breakdown of the assessment for Arlington. The required minimum contribution is determined by the state, primarily driven by um, uh, chapter 70 formula and enrollment. Then the transportation assessment, the assessment over the minimum required contribution in our debt and capital assessment uh, for a subtotal of 6,732,038. Uh, the building project debt service at a million eight thirty one ninety one, which was exempt from um, uh, Prop 2.5 through a uh, debt exclusion vote of the community uh, for a total assessment of uh, $8,562,229, which is a reduction from FY24 of $370,687. Just to go over the next few slides, you'll see on slide five that our overall operating and capital budget that the school committee voted was $31,517,219 which is 3.96% above the current year FY24. And that breaks down on slide six through our operating recommendation, uh, which is less than three, slightly less than 3% at 24,160,849. The capital recommendation of 1,660,508 is up considerably, uh, primarily due to one item that we'll be talking about as we go through the presentation and the debt uh, uh, recommendation of, of just under 5.7 is about 1.36%. We expect as we move forward, now that our debt service has kicked in uh, 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 on all of our, our bond issues and their, uh, their um, the level payments each year, that you'll see that tend to stabilize uh, going forward. On slide seven, you'll see our total assessments to member uh, towns is $25,689,923. It's a 0.82% increase over assessments in fiscal 24. That is not a, a, a norm. That's a little bit of anomaly. We'll talk to that because we don't want that to be uh, perceived as uh, a trend. 
<laughs> I think we need to make sure that we're clear on what's going on with that. So we'll talk to that a little bit. We just want to get into what's going on with the Minuteman budget. So on slide eight, we'll talk about some of the some of the drivers. Our collective bargaining agreement was 3.5% plus steps and lanes for FY25. We did reduce a couple of administrative positions that were budgeted in FY24. There were some uh, three positions that were in the district budget, but then when COVID hit, we uh, reduced those positions, but we, we, uh, we brought them back through grants. And now that those grants are starting to go away, there is still the need for the position. So we are bringing back into the district budget a library aid, um, a health tech aid, and a co-op coordinator. We're seeing considerable uh, interest in the, uh, the co-op uh, opportunities for students, and they are uh, taking advantage of that. We're very, very pleased uh, at, that, uh, at seeing that trend. Um, we did have to add back a foreign language teacher uh, we had one who uh, who retired last year who taught both Spanish and French. Uh, you don't find folks like that uh, that that often. So we uh, we did have a need to bring back a foreign language teacher, even though we thought we could go without. Uh, and we also um, uh, brought on an athletic trainer to meet our obligations under the uh, state MIAA um, regulations as well as to support our student athletes, because we are seeing, again, some of the co-op, uh, quite a bit of um, activity and interest with our, our student body participating in, um, in, in sports. We're really pleased about that and seeing more engagement from our students. Um, as we go on to the next slide, we look at some of our non-salary items. Uh, transportation, our, our bus transportation contract is up 5% based upon the CPI pursuant to the contract. And we are recommending an additional day for a uh, late bus. We currently have two late buses, which allow students to participate in uh, homework, uh, extra help homework club activities, as well as their, their club activities, whatever they may be. And we're finding, given the increased enrollment, that students have more of an interest in being around the campus and participating in more clubs. But if they participate in more clubs and they have to do after school help, there's just simply not enough time. So we're trying to accommodate that. Uh, again, more student engagement on campus um, and, and taking advantage of some of the opportunities that we provide. Utilities has decreased. That's based on actual usage in FY23. We level funded our health insurance because in FY24, we anticipated somewhere around a 10% increase. That never materialized. It ended up being a zero increase. So if we simply level fund it, uh, it should accommodate uh, uh, FY25 adequately. We, uh, we are making an investment in cybersecurity. One of the things that I was concerned about coming in was the reliability and uh, resiliency of our uh, of our technology infrastructure. It's one of those things that keeps me up at night. And uh, we really wanted to make a commitment to trying to do whatever we can to tighten our uh, cybersecurity program. So our uh, IT director had, had taken, uh, taken advantage of a study that gave us some insight as to some of the things we need to look at and we're moving forward with a comprehensive cybersecurity program. It's about $120,000 in this year's budget. Moving on to slide number, oops, slide number 10. Um, we have uh, funding of OPEB. Uh, we have, uh, in our debt service, we've uh, provided uh, our athletic fields. We have a, a bond issue of about $1.9 million. When we, uh, when we proposed the athletic fields uh, a few years back, um, that was as a result of some savings that we realized from the school building project, but the savings wasn't enough to complete the athletic fields. So we had to go back to the member towns for, uh, for borrowing authorization of $1.9 million. At the time we proposed that plan, we had uh, projections on how the, the by renting the, uh, the fields, 
that the uh, revenue that was generated would go into a revolving account and would be able to offset the debt service associated with that with those fields. Year one, we did not budget that um, uh, because at the time the debt service was issued, we were putting the budget together, the fields were not online yet. So we didn't have a real true idea of what the revenue would be. However, now that they're fully uh, rented and um, uh, we've been taking advantage of that, we'll be able to now offset the, uh, the debt service associated uh, with, the, uh, uh, with, that, with that bond. Uh, on our capital stabilization account, I mentioned earlier, you saw a jump in what's causing the capital line to jump go up so, so substantially. And that's because over the last number of years, we've been putting aside $500,000 towards our uh, capital stabilization account. This year, uh, this budget funds it an additional 350. So the total of 850,000 is what's, uh, what's being proposed in this budget. That'll bring our capital stabilization fund up to uh, just about uh, $3 million. This will put us in a position to be able to maintain and, and pursue potential uses of the campus uh, in terms of um, uh, partnerships or any type of renovations we need to do um, and have that funding in place to mitigate future assessment increases to member towns. So it's just a, it's just sort of a, uh, a ongoing long-term planning effort that we've been trying to make. And um, uh, we'll, we'll talk to that a little bit as we, as we go forward. So on our next slide, uh, I'll ask Nikki to take us through the next few slides. You do want to pause for questions. <laughs> How about it? Yeah. Um, what's your status of the OPEB? Now, how well how well funded are you? Yeah, so um, our OPEB currently is around twenty three million. Um, with our contribution this year, we will be at five percent funded. Um, we put together an OPEB study committee in twenty twenty one. The school committee did, and uh, the plan for the OPEB increased funding will happen next year when our ESCO lease comes off the books. ESCO lease is um, essentially a, a stranded asset, a energy saving lease on the old building that we're still paying for all of the 16 previous member towns. So as that comes off in FY26, we will increase our OPEB contribution $300,000 um, one time. And then each year we plan to increase it 5%. Um, so, so we're 23 million liability? 23 million. Okay, and, uh, at the end of next year, you will have funded 5% of that? Correct. Thank you. Yep. Annie. Um, okay. So you were going to explain why the capital recommendation is up 34%? Yes, it's that increase in the 350000 uh, is okay. primarily driving that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on in the presentation, okay. specifically how that's being earmarked. I just didn't want to miss it. Charlie? Um, Superintendent Holly, uh, I, I heard last year, I think, that the fields were uh, outsourced or leased out to a third party. Is that true? Well, we do rent the, we rent the fields, um, but it's being uh, leased out by Minutemans. Uh, we, we control uh, all of those rental bookings. Uh, we are considering uh, engaged with a, uh, in a uh, negotiation with Leslie University about uh, participating in a partnership where in exchange for our allocated field time, uh, field and gym time, uh, they would uh, invest uh, in building a grandstands, uh, a field house, concession stands, uh, six tennis courts. Uh, it's approximately about a $15 million project. Um, and uh, we'll, that would be um, that would be a 20 year lease, which is a 10 year uh, lease with two five year options. And under that agreement, they would have um, they would have use that's earmarked uh, for Leslie uh, University practices and NCAA uh, games. Um, but right now, Leslie is one of our major tenants that's renting the fields. Kevin, we were talking about that partnership with Leslie a year, year and a half ago. Is that is that a reality? Which, yeah, we had a meeting in fact this morning about the, some of the terms of it. We've already awarded the contract. 
and we they are we authorize them to do a site uh, site feasibility study. Uh, they're very interested in this, and um, we're hoping to be able to have it wrapped up by June, mm -hmm. as far as the agreement, the license agreement goes. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> on that subject, uh, does that mean that they will be uh, given priority over any other third parties that want to use the fields, but that the, but the student use, Minuteman student use is still um, not reduced, put it that way. No, uh, it's still the Minuteman athletic facility and in in the, in Minuteman will have first use of it. Uh, Minuteman will have priority use just like our theater or any other facility that we rent. Uh, Leslie will have uh, time that has will be committed each year that they can use for their events, and then whatever times remaining will be uh, will be rented. We do have other renters that uh, that, that use the uh, facilities. It's and we need to make sure that we're generating revenue from in that revolving account so that we can continue to support uh, a capital replacement program for the fields as well as the debt service commitment that we've made to our member towns. Thank you, Grant. Yes, thank you. Um, same sort of one. Um, so it's going to be less revenue anticipated if you went to this agreement with Leslie? Yes. And uh, essentially, it's sort of a trade off, isn't it? Uh, you're getting less revenue, but you're getting investment and capital from Leslie. Correct. Um, the reduction in revenue is probably uh, considered in the um, uh, Fund that you have a established revolving fund because it will be it will decrease. That's correct. We we would expect that um, that the revenue that we would generate without Leslie Leslie's revenue would be able to support uh, pretty much on a break even basis. Um, you know the debt service capital replacement for that as well as in the theater. Sure. Thanks. One one more. Um, are these capital improvements to the field that you're planning for Leslie? Are they linked into the stabilization fund for the capital? Uh, no, that's that's a separate Both issue that same. I'll talk to in a little bit. Yeah. And if Leslie doesn't enter this agreement, would that get folded into it? Uh, it may change our priorities. Um, as I said, I'm hopeful that we'll have an agreement in place okay. by June. It and, sounds like it's and if a good we have, probability it'll happen, I understand. And if we have to pivot, then we'll have to pivot. But um, it's a $15 million investment on Leslie's part. Uh, that would be rather substantial for Minuteman to move forward on. And I'm not sure there's the appetite among the member towns to make that commitment for that purpose. That's why we think this partnership would work sure. ideally for both parties. And you think it's a good chance of it going through? We're very optimistic, I'll say. Thank you. Yes. Um, how did you manage no increase in health insurance? Um, we are part of the Mass Bay Health Trust Fund. Um, currently, um, I am sitting on the board, and we have a considerable amount of reserves due to um, low um, experience claims. Claims. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. Um, so um, due to that, uh, for the past two years, they've um, done a 0% increase in the, the health insurance. Um, this health trust is with four other uh, regional school districts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is the 686 enrollment, is that pretty much capacity? Is that mm -hmm. full house? The six... Uh, where are we at? We're at 686 right now. Yeah, 686 right now. That is in excessive capacity. In excess, okay. Uh, the school was built for about for, for 628 students. That was the design plan. Yep. Uh, now that we've been living in the building a few years and see what it can and can't do, uh, it's probably somewhere in the area of 660. So, six, even, so even though where it's 686, we had to scramble this past summer, to be perfectly honest with you, yeah. to create space and to um, 
and find that we had some class, primarily classrooms. The job space with the exception of the animal science program, all the other shops are fine. It's the classroom space. And um, so last fall, the school committee took a, a listened to some of the issues we had regarding the facilities and the capacity and uh, decided that we would hold our enrollment to 175 each year for freshmen. Uh, that doesn't necessarily add up to 660, but our historical trends will show that there's usually a drop off from freshman to yeah. senior year, and, and that would get us somewhere we would expect, give or take, within the 660 students. Thank you. Well, we're on the topic of enrollment, and that's where we stop. So why you take it from there? All right. Um, so major uh, factor impacting the budget is the overall enrollment. Um, so with the plans of the, of the new school building, um, you know, came plans um, to increase member town enrollment, and that is is what we're seeing. The red line shows the increase in member town enrollment. The green line shows the decrease in non-member town enrollment. Um, that is mostly the students that had come in their freshman and sophomore year, um, matriculating out of the school, right? So these are the juniors and seniors still um, finishing up their program. Um, the last two freshman classes we've seen uh, fully member town students. You can go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Yep. Oh, uh, this is just a curiosity. Where did Belmont and Watertown kids go? Yeah. I mean, they, they were two of the bigger senders before the project. I'm just sort of curious where um, they went. Yeah, that is a, a great question. Do you happen? I don't know, to know? the answer to that question. Uh, we continue to get applications. Um, this past year, we didn't accept any. Um, whether we do this year or not, we're in our uh, uh, cycle now where we have issued our acceptance letters out. Um, um, but we shall see if there's room for our district students and if they're from those communities, if they may be able to have an opportunity to attend. But I don't know where they're currently going right now. Okay. Just curious. Thank you. Okay. So um, to that question, um, how are Arlington students doing on this cycle? Are, will we have to admit everyone or any of them on the wait list? What's going on? Yeah. Um, let we have two more two slides coming up that I'll explain okay. all that data too. <laughs> so um, our next is enrollment by town, and you'll see um, our LinkedIn's data for each of the classes broken out. Um, so the class of 2027, uh, 45 students, 2026, 61 students, 2025, 60 students, and 2024, 49 students, and that totals up to the 215 Arlington students. Um, the next slide will show the incoming freshman class of 2028. Um, so the slot allocation for Arlington was 40 students. And um, as of March 1st, 65 students from Arlington applied. They were all offered admission. And as of today, 46 accepted and 19 declined. Um, we did get some data as to why students were declining. Um, majority of that data was they didn't want to leave their friends. So mm. um, they, didn't want, they didn't want to leave their friends. They wanted to stay at Arlington, you know, at Arlington High School. Um, there were some other um, small two or three uh, students said athletic competition, um, academic, arts and music, social, emotional. So, you know, a small amount of data, but majority um, was due to the they didn't want to leave their friends. Um, so this data too shows um, which of the top choice program Arlington students were most interested in for the 65 incoming freshmen. Um, and just to you know kind of give you a background, these are their preliminary choices and they're not binding for the student. Um, each student will spend the first half of their year in exploratory, checking out all of the 19 major programs. And then they'll pick their top five where they'll spend two weeks in each of the top five programs and just explore more in depth as to what that program is. Um, and they'll make their final choice, their top three at the end of the second quarter. So it's certainly not binding, but some of the data that you know was requested, um, we wanted to provide back to you. Yeah. 
this is a curiosity question, but um, I noticed carpentry, plumbing, electrical. What about masonry and tile? I've often wondered why. We don't we don't offer that. I know, but I'm just curious as to why. Yeah, maybe the, the, the demand when we took a look at it uh, wasn't okay. there. Maybe we couldn't accommodate it within the building at the time. Um, we haven't looked at that in quite a while. Okay, just because when I think about putting a house together. Oh, no. Yeah, that's fair. fair Every question. bathroom of the kitchen. Yeah. Daryl. What kind of trend, trends are you seeing in terms of in which of these uh, programs are increasing the popularity, decreasing? One of the ones that's really uh, become very popular is the animal science program. Uh, that seems to generate uh, a considerable amount of interest. Um, we also see um, our multimedia engineering uh, program, which is kind of like a radio, TV, theater type of a, a program that, that's also generating a lot of interest. And then, you know, we always, our, our core shops will be, will always do well, electrical, carpentry, plumbing. But then you have some of the, uh, the biotech and, and um, environmental science that we also get a pretty good draw at uh, as well. So it kind of, it's kind of a mix, but the one I would say right now that generates the most interest is the animals. Thank you. Dean. Um. I guess because there's new people, some of you are, I mean, they'll mention Mahoney, but I guess I do guys are, are new here. Um, I think I'd be remiss, this might be a good point to mention it, which is, um, you know, this finance committee, I feel like I'm going to be the old person who's this for the next 25 years, but uh, this finance committee, like, fought really hard for a long time to get a new regional agreement in place, sort out the members who didn't want to be there get the school rebuilt and get it to where it is now, okay? Um, and I think I have a good sense of this committee and, and town meeting and the select board and the school committee, when I, and our, our school committee and I when I say, we just don't give a damn about non-member towns. Like we paid for the building, okay? We pay a third of the cost and I don't care. I really, I don't, I say it every year. I don't care if these kids, these towns who've decided to leave the district don't have a choice. Like. That was their elected officials' decision to walk away, right? And I'm, I'm going to be just as bitter in 20 years as I was six years ago sitting in some of these stupid senior centers trying to convince them not to leave, right? But, like, this is, and, and I, I just hope that we, both this year and into the future, continue with these policies that until all the member kids are allowed in, no one else is allowed in. Like, if, we, if they're not allowed, if we get to the point where we have vacancies, we didn't fill up our things, and we can then look for some non member that's fine. But it, this, that, you know, because we had this little hiccup a few years ago with this, right? Um, which is probably still why some of the juniors are still in there. I think that remains the position of Arlington. Like our town, like we built the building, we pay for the building, we want to be there with our kids first. And that's the way we do it. I know. Okay. I'm going to say it every year. We got it. So I can remain. <laughs> so there's no misunderstanding any year how this works. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't communicating something that was inaccurate. I only got like 20 more years to say about it. All right. And uh, in total, we are happy to report of, um, you know, the 175 slot allocation. Uh, as of today, we did accept 175 um, member town students. Um, so we are anticipating a, a, a full uh, member town freshman class. Over. Yeah, this might be a good time to ask this. I'm curious, and most of the sounds like most of the class of 2023, I guess, would have been went on to college from all. Yeah. And I can certainly see some of say in culinary going to Johnson and Wales. Mm -hmm. That's a logical direction. I could see probably animal science going to some sort of veterinary mm -hmm. program. But some of these, you know, in traditional Vogue, you're usually thinking they're going to, you know, uh, maybe a trade, you know, trades or apprenticeships or something like that. So what do people end up like, maybe, how, what is the path like? Because obviously a lot of people are doing it. They're going to these various colleges. Uh, what do they major in? I mean, how, does that, how does that work? Well, as we tried to articulate in one of the earlier slides that um, students have the choice 
that's the value of what we provide. And um, a lot of these students that did go on to um, to college stayed within their program major. I mean, it's, what we show students is the opportunities. We, we, we illustrate it on, it's called a career tree, if you will. And in each shop, there's a tree and it's a, it's a visual that would suggest the trunk of the tree is the high school education. And then if you get out and graduate, you go right into the field, there'll be these opportunities for you if you go right to the trade. You go up a little more on the tree, that's maybe you go on for a two-year education and these occupations will be available for you. You go a little higher on the tree, four years, these occupations. So in each and every shop, there will be those jobs listed at each level of the tree so students can kind of say okay maybe i'll go to a two-year school and and maybe i'll be a service manager at a dealership rather than a technician at the dealership mm -hmm. that type of an example each shop has those so students can look at it and kind of visualize where they'd like to go that'd be interesting to see yeah we can get that for you yeah yeah that's yeah. just that's, it makes that makes sense to me what you're saying mm -hmm. oh would students and parents come in yeah, they, they get it. So, so I'll add just one color commentary since my son actually graduated from Minuteman last spring. Is that the students are also doing research to understand what the um, you know the their their risk versus the cost of living and what kind of salary they may make at different places in the tree branches, if you will. And um, what's really interesting is that when it comes to electric and construction there were a lot of young women that graduated last spring. And when they were interviewed, this is the, um, the uh, singer dance uh, step and repeat video that was on YouTube. The young women in electrical, when they were asked, what are they going to do next? They said, well, I'm gonna continue my apprenticeship. And then one day I'm gonna run my own business. And it was so refreshing to see the diversity that's going into some of these industries that are traditionally men. And these women that feel empowered to run their own businesses. Um, and we'll be happy to get you the tree. We'll figure out how to get it to Al to share with the group. Um, Michael. Yeah, I remember looking at the numbers for this. A lot of the kids graduate from the what we call the traditional shops, um, you know, tools and materials, construction, things like that. Um, they do continue their education. It's it's not matriculating at another institution. It's it's gaining the on-the-job experience to go from to, to go from journeyman to license to general to master, uh, oftentimes in the family business. And the ones that take on more, more formal classroom education after that oftentimes are in business or, or accounting to run that run, run that business that they have now, you know grown into at, and after 20 years, they take over. We see this a lot in, in, in quite a few of the trades. It's nothing prouder than, than, than seeing somebody's truck repainted and son and or and daughter. Oh. I think we can move on to the next slide then. Um, so this was a, a question that was asked about the withdrawals and transfers. So. Uh, we wanted to share with you the number of withdrawals um, from Arlington from each class of, um, you know, you will see there is, you know, a bit of an uptake in the class of 2022, 2023, 2024. Um, you know, some of that data is, is due to COVID. Um, some of the data that we're seeing now in particular um, is due to the new Arlington High School being built. Mm -hmm. um, and the level of, um, you know, athletic competition um, has been mentioned a few times. Um, inter interestingly enough, um, along with, um, you know, wanting to stay with their friends. Um, but it is pretty rare that we see transfers after October 1. So that's the number that you'll see in our budget book. Um, I think we went past um, and, and dug back uh, about 10 years or so, and th there had only been maybe five transfers after October 1. Um, typically, uh, withdrawals and transfers uh, for the higher grades, grades 10 through 12, are very uncommon. Um, they've kind of already started in their program. Um, 
those transfers, you'll typically see someone coming from another voc school uh, or tech school that's that's moved into the area. Um, but typically, um, they'll have to um, see if there's room in the shops, if, if that's the case, if someone was interested in transferring. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, Jennifer, you have Thank you. Um, thanks very much for including this. I had asked this question. Yep. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly. So the, the question that I had asked, I was particularly concerned about transfers that happen during the school year, not the summer, summer okay. attrition. So this table, are those kids who transferred during the school year or is that also the summer? No, yeah, this, you know, so even from the data, you know, that I we've just reported. So the, um, the freshman class this year, there was, um, 79 applicants and 45 came came to the school. So um, we'll certainly track that data better. But as far as after October 1st, so, um, you know, the start of the school year that gives that gives about a month. Yeah. Um, we don't we typically don't see any transfers or withdrawals after October 1st. There may be a smaller amount from you know September to October as they're you know first getting into school. Um, but we haven't necessarily tracked that data. But um, this is the data from applic applications and then, um, so this includes yeah. the summer. Correct. Okay. So, so you really don't know what it is during the school year? Um, you know, it, it could be, a, it could be a variety of reasons kind of that we've discussed, um, you know, them wanting to be back with their friends academics, um, maybe the, the shops weren't the, the right ones for them. Um, but because we don't see many um, past October 1, um, you know, five five total over a, a number of years, um, it, it's pretty, pretty limited. Yeah, what we data. see overall is in our freshman class, total class, yeah. about 5% uh, withdraw during the course of the year, just because it's not the right fit for the student. Um, then as you get into your upper class uh, groups, uh, if you see uh, students withdrawing, it's primarily due to maybe family moving or something along those lines. You don't, once a student is in their shop and they, they like what they're doing, we don't see a, a, a lot of students leaving. In fact, sometimes if, if families move, they'll try and make an accommodation to, to arrange housing for the student in the district so that the student can finish it and that can be complicated. Um, so it, it doesn't sound like you quite have the data that I'm looking for, but maybe we could follow up because the, the sure. idea that five-ish kids come back over the last 10 years like doesn't fit with kids that I know who've moved back. Okay. Um, so maybe we could follow up and talk sure. about, about the kids who are moving during the school year. Thank you. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not quite, this is not quite confusing for me. So what are the numbers on the red? When you say, because you have post-October 1st withdrawals and transfers, and you say that follows the 5% withdrawal, but then you say you rarely see transfers after the start of school. So, I mean, are these students that were admitted but elected not to come? Or I'm just not quite sure what, or it maybe. Could be, these, you know, these span throughout the, the four years as well. So, um, you know, for the class of 2022, right? 20, you know, 34 total, 25 returned to Arlington. That could have been their freshman, sophomore, junior, oh, or senior. So it covers all four years. Yeah. Um, so 25 returned, eight had moved. Um, and then there were, you know, some so small other buckets right. that we Although you're saying probably right. most of the ones so, that move, or, or moving, so that can happen in time. You said it's pretty rare for someone to leave after their freshman year. So one would think that maybe a good chunk of that, if they return to AHS, a good chunk of that 25 is probably uh, freshman year. So typically, we see. Yes. Yeah. So they different. come into it and they do it. Yep. And then and if they leave, I guess after October 1, what happens with the money for the student at that point? Um, if they go back to AHS, like does the money come with them, or is it just rolled into the next budget for the next year? And they roll it? That's how it would, it would lag. In other words, October one yeah. is when the, the that's, state they says wants that's, the, it. that's where they want the enrollment. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So yeah. if that student had left, they wouldn't be on the next year's. They, right, they wouldn't be continuing, but then they 
Yep. In some sense, you'd have the money for the year, but they would bring right. back the HS and they didn't have the services there. So, yeah, it, so it's good that these numbers are going down, though, which is not, again, surprising because high school data doesn't. Jonathan. Uh, yeah, so I would also be interested in seeing the post October 1st numbers because I've also heard. Or no people who come back. So just curious what numbers. Um, I have actually the reverse question. Um, so if a student wanted to go to Minuteman after the freshman year, maybe because they moved into the district and they're new, or or some other reason, are there slots available starting at sophomore year, or is it, is it just if you don't get there freshman year, that's not doesn't work? We you can be considered for tenth grade. Okay. But. But not, not beyond not. that, because you won't have enough hours to meet your, your, your right. program credentials. So how many um, and people that's, And that's all based on space. So, you know? okay, so if you have space, it's year by year, change of each year. Right. We were looking at transfers just recently, and it doesn't look like if we may, we probably have about 10 or 4, 12 in-district applications to transfer in. One opted to go back as a freshman to get in. Um, but uh, we would probably, if any, maybe, maybe three. Okay. But it's 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 given what we what we get going on with the current freshman class, it's mm -hmm. unlikely. Okay. Great. All right. Okay. We can move on to the next slide. Um, there was a question on the state metric data as well, so um, we got some information from our. Um, our data analytics um, coordinator, and um, it was in relation to the nine, the grade nine course passing um, appearing low. So there was a reported failure, reported failure rate in the ELA um, because of an error in the coding um, for a certain elective. Um, so this has been confirmed with DESI. It was corrected. Um, it will not be reposted on the website that. Um, the link is below, but only nine of those freshman students had failed. So the total pass rate is 94.5%, which is consistent with the pass rates for history, um, math, science, and other elective courses being between, you know, 90s, 97, 98, 99%. We were aware of that problem when we had an issue. So I think we can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, so, so as we talked about, as, in, as enrollment shifting, uh, Minutemans out of district uh, revenue is decreasing, um, which you know was expected. So as member towns um, enrollment increases, you'll soon see the overall assessments um, being shifted to uh, the member towns. And on the next slide, um, you'll see our estimated uh, financial forecast uh, for this. So as the students matric matriculate out with each grade, um, you'll see that the tuition and the incremental special education fee that comes with the out-of-district students being at Minuteman. Um, for FY25, we have an $818,000 offset. We're anticipating an FY26, $373,000, and FY27, thousand. So you'll see that there is um, quite a big decrease um, expected in the upcoming years. And with our out-of-district capital fee, uh, estimated offset this year for the FY25 budget of 20, 277,000, and then a decrease in FY26 to 110,000 and FY27 to 14,000. So within the next two um, fiscal years, 26 and 27, um, we wanted to be ahead of the game notifying you um, that as the member town, the non-member town students matriculate out, um, the revenue that's associated with them will also decrease. And okay. are the percentage of kids on IEPs still in the forty percent plus range? Forty percent. Yes. Um, so this is the preliminary assessments. Uh, for each of the member towns in total, 0.82% um, increase for preliminary assessments. Um, the 
Two columns to the right are four-year rolling average, which is our main um, driver in our budget, uh, in our operating budget. And um, that is 12.6%. You'll see in particular for Arlington, there is a decrease this year, negative uh, 4.15% uh, in the assessment, while the increase is 10.1% in the four-year rolling average. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this and how it affects Arlington, but um, you know we'll see the reasons for the decrease. Um, we'll explain a little bit further, but Arlington overall uh, percent assessments thirty three percent and thirty five percent enrollment. So overall, in total, it appears to be reasonably consistent um, percentages. And overall, um, you know, we kind of compared the minimum required contribution in different buckets, and those appear to be um, reasonably consistent. Um, and it's the assessments over the minimum contribution that has decreased. So we can con continue on to the uh, historical assessment trends. Um, you'll see in, in prior years, um, FY24, 23, and 22. Um, the percent change in the assessment and the percent change in the four-year rolling average. Um, again, the main driver being the four-year rolling average um, for our operating budget. So you'll see those track um, pretty closely. And we can continue on to the per pupil cost analysis where um, Kevin will pick up unless there's any other questions. So a question we often get is, why is Minuteman's per pupil cost analysis high? Uh, Minuteman's per pupil cost has always been relatively high ever since I've been associated with Minuteman going back 10 or 11 years now. Um, and there are uh, a few drivers to that that, um, that may give some insight on some of that. Uh, our teacher salaries are very high. On the, they're on the high end. When you look at where we are statewide with vocational technical schools with third, uh, when you look at where we stand within our member districts, um, we're also third. Some of the drivers of that is because some of our member districts um, uh, pay it at, at high levels. And when we compete for positions, uh, we have to pay uh, where we see, think of competitive rates. Also, when you have um, bringing people out of, uh, uh, out of the trade, we have to uh, pay them the similar salaries that you pay that's in either in the union or in the profession uh, that, that drives us a little higher. Um, so that's a, that's one of the reasons that uh, we see teacher salaries so high. Um, and we also have a very veteran staff, about two thirds, what was the statistic? Two thirds of our, of our uh, teaching staff are on the top scale. Was that it? on the top scale? So. We have a veteran teaching staff that um, is making it the high end, and that's dri that's driving it considerably as well. We also have a special education class to consider, so we have a lot of co-teaching uh, in our classrooms. Forty percent of our students are receiving special education services, and therefore uh, we have some classrooms that have uh, two teachers in there uh, providing that support to the students. So that, that's a that's a considerable driver when we look at our, our, our salaries. Uh, the, other, the other area that we see uh, our cost extraordinarily high compared to other regional school districts, regional vocational school districts, is our transportation. When you look at some of the other, uh, some of the other vocational technical schools in the area, think of Shawsheen, think of the show, but think of Acevit. Um, a lot of those schools, when you look at them in a map, are centered within the district. Whereas when you look at Minuteman, it's basically uh, Arlington is the furthest east, and then uh, everything else either goes south or west out to Lancaster, Bolton, Stoke. So when we look at our, 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 our daily bus run costs, that's, that's considerably higher than when we did comparisons with some of the other regional vocational schools. Um, so it, 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 it is a, uh, those are some of the drivers. It's not completely all of them. Um, but it's, it's one of the things that when we compare to other, other towns, uh, sort of the three main reasons that we think, uh, 
uh, is driving the uh, the per pupil cost. Can I pause there? Charlie? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I, I two sort of two questions regarding this. One is, have you done any analysis of what your cost trends were before the new school building and now after the new school building? Uh, looking at what specifically? Well, um, you know, the, the change in student to teacher ratios, or I, I know that we went through a, a program of changing the, the academic. Um, Get the term, but the, the modality of having different, um, I, I want to say colleges, but they're not colleges, but you had these these uh, different dual enrollment type of program? No, 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 no. The, the uh, silos for your different specialties. Shops. That's a, no. it's sort of a, a change that you went through about three years ago. <laughs> Am I missing? I, I, I wish I can't speak to it very well because I wasn't. I'm sorry, I can't remember the term, yeah. the term of art that was used, but academy model of teaching. Oh, the academy. The academy model. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think all Thank the you. academy thanks, like the, the only intention of the academy model is to to really emphasize how academic teachers and vocational teachers uh, interrelate with one another. You know, back. Back in the day, you had the academic teachers collaborating with each other and the vocational teachers collaborating with each other, and never the two shall meet. But now, what we have is we have uh, uh, collaborations where the science teacher and the math teacher will meet with the carpentry teacher and they'll talk about different disciplines that math and, uh, and, and science may have in carpentry. That, that's the type of thing. But, that collaboration doesn't necessarily lead to any type of staffing reductions or anything like that. Or, I mean, I'm asking both, both ways. Yeah, no. Okay. No. So then the second question is, uh, with respect to special education costs, is there any, does Minuteman have more special education students than other vocational schools? And yes. if so, why? Yes. Um, Perhaps some of our member town districts encourage students to, to, to apply, um, maybe. I do know that what I can say is students that uh, that receive special education services thrive at minimum. They do extremely well. Um, we provide a high level of services for the students and they, they prove to be very successful. Some students uh, work better in an environment where you're doing hands-on experiential learning rather than classroom, you know, all day, seven periods a day. So it's historically been that way. In fact, the 40% that I mentioned is lower than it's been in the last number of years. And, um, but we've always found that we've been very successful with students receiving uh, student services. Have you looked at the per pupil cost if controlling the transportation, like if you went to five other schools, took the transportation costs out, take the transportation costs out of Minuteman, what sort of differences do you see? Yeah, we did. We took a look at, you know, uh, special education. We took a look at transportation. We're still on the higher end, frankly. Um, but but we didn't look at that. Thank you. Uh, how was the utility costs? Uh, What's the impact on the utility costs from moving into your new building versus the old one? You know, have you have you achieved the savings I think you were hoping for? Did you look at that? Um, I think you know within the past two years, they we hadn't necessarily um, seen the building running, you know, due to COVID um, with maximum amount of students. So now that we're actually had like a full year of last year looking at you know actuals, I think. You know, we were able to make this um, decrease to the budget to make it more in line with what, um, you know, the optimal idea for the school is. I haven't necessarily compared it to when we were running the old school building. I can certainly do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this budget reflects, um, you know, a more accurate utilities cost um, now that we've, you know, had the school running um, with, you know, full students. Everybody's got to buy it now, right? 
Yes, we yeah. have been LEED certified. So it's going to be more efficient than the LEED. So okay. thank you. As utilities were up, utilities were up in the new building. They're up for a, a smaller building with fewer students for the first two, three years that the building was open. Is that under control now? It is, yes. In this budget, we have decreased our utilities um, to reflect some savings that we are seeing. It's good to know. Yeah. So it's an all electric building, yes? The new building? No. No, we have some natural gas that we use as well as electric. For heating? What is that? You know what's up yet? Uh, I don't know. I think it's natural <laughs> gas. Yeah, I think it's natural gas as I heat. Um, and do you have solar on the roof? Yes, we do. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So we want to talk about um, why our assessment percentage was so low uh, this year. Uh, and there's three basic uh, bullets that we wanted to talk to. Um, and the first one is that there was an adjustment in the chapter 70 state aid that we budgeted last year um, that impacted this year's budget, for example. So what happened last year was we budgeted about uh, $3.1 million, um, $3 million in chapter 70 state aid. Um, because when we adopted our budget at the end of January, the, the, the governor's budget hadn't been released yet. Um, as a result of um, once that budget was released and it went through its, the legislative process, the actual number that we received for Chapter 70 was um, uh, 3.9 million. So in, in essence, Minuteman received about $781,000 more than uh, what we had budgeted. And, um, and, and that raised some questions from some of our member towns about, you know, how do we handle it? Can we rebate it in FY24? Uh, and we have a proposal that we'll be talking to in the, in the next, next slide. But I think the real takeaway from that is that did skew the number in a way that makes the uh, assessments look lower than they actually would have been under this proposed budget to, it would probably some be closer to 4% increase in assessments had we budgeted FY24, Chapter 70 compared to FY25. Uh, the other item that Nikki talked about a little bit was the, um, I'm sorry, that I talked about a little bit was the athletic field debt service. Since that's the first year that that's implemented, that you can plan on seeing that $114,000, $115,000 uh, each year as an offset. Um, but seeing it for the first year does create a reduction in assessments. And then um, out of district tuition and capital fees, as, uh, as Nikki mentioned earlier, as, as we see that revenue start to tail out, and those are students that are currently in the, in the school that will be graduating, uh, that'll shift some of that, that cost onto uh, a number of towns. So. so getting back to the discussion on the... Uh, Chapter 70 uh, budget for this year. Uh, as I mentioned, there was some uh, questions from our member towns whether we should uh, uh, rebate uh, those funds uh, through lower assessments this year. And um, I was able to meet with all the town administrators and town villages <coughs> in the district. And we worked through a proposal whereby um, uh, this is sort of the breakdown of of what Minuteman voted versus, uh, I said 3.1, 2.1 million versus 2.9 million. So $781,000 difference that Minuteman received that we hadn't budgeted or planned for. And on the right-hand side, you'll see um, the uh, what rebates would have been received by each town. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, we had a discussion with our, with our town managers and town administrators regarding where we are with the, uh, with the school building project. We haven't closed out the project yet. We expect to close it out maybe by September or so. So we still have outstanding short-term borrowing of about $2.8 million. We're expecting about $2.2 million from MSBA when they release the final reimbursement. 
which leaves a balance that would need to be financed once the project's closed out of about 565,000. So the proposal that we discussed with the town administrators and town managers is rather than refunding the 781,000, can we take that 565 plus another 50 grand or so in interest? So total required cost to close out would be 200, I mean, 615,000. Can we take uh, 615 from the, uh, from the 782 and apply that against the balance that's due on the uh, on the MSBA project. That'll alleviate the need to finance that over the next three or four years. Have it raised on the on the uh, on the recap sheet uh, as additional exempted debt and save about one hundred and forty five thousand dollars a year. And that was. Uh, accepted by all town managers and all town administrators. So it's our intention, uh, given that uh, vote of support, to move forward with uh, an amended budget at the April school committee meeting that will allow us to commit those funds uh, towards uh, closing out the building project um, and then the, the balance of which we would probably recommend either uh, OPEB or capital stabilization or something in that respect. So. That's how we handled the uh, the excess chapter 70 um, funds that we received. Does anyone have any questions on that process? No, I do, I'm sure. Uh, what, this seems like this discussion is really in addition to the fact that we've had a reduction in the appropriation this year, right? Yes. And, um, not all the towns had a reduction, but Arlington did. Uh, maybe one or two other towns did. But overall, the assessment was relative, the growth of the assessment was relatively lower than in the past. That's correct. Now, I think uh, in Arlington's case, my memory serves me right, about $150,000 or $170,000 of that is associated with the fields, with the, with the fact that this year you're, you're Absorbing the uh, debt service on the fields is that is that, is that the right number of the three hundred and seventy thousand reduction? Yeah, it'd be about forty thousand related to the fields. Forty thousand. Yeah. So what's the rest of the reduction? It's it's just primarily due to the fact that the uh, the state aid is basically over uh, overstated, if you will, because we received this windfall in FY. 24. When you when we get to the budget slides comparing year over year, it's going to show like there's a, a a rather significant increase in revenue. The reality is that's not the case. It basically ended up being level funded. So just by by uh, just the way it's represented, we would have a have a decrease. If we were to adjust that model and say, all right, we'll just plug in the 2.9 million that we actually got in FY24 and compare it to FY25, Arlington would still receive a, a, a decrease because the budget overall is relatively stable, but it would only be what, 90,000 or so? Yeah, it'd, 1%. It'd be, it'd be about one, a 1% 1 decrease. So um, I think if part of it's a function of the chapter 78 is what's causing the decrease and part of it is just uh, where, where the budget growth is. Thank you. Next slide, please. So I, I've been kind of delaying this one, but this is the question that's been asked a couple of times. We have a building that's on campus. Uh, we refer to it as the East Building. It, it uh, We've had it for years. It was built by the students, and it was occupied for a number of years by the uh, Bright Horizons Child, Child Care Group, and, and there was a private school called the Tremont School that, that occupied it. Um, but in, in recent years, um, we haven't been uh, occupying the building and it's, it's starting to deteriorate and it's, it, it needs some serious attention. And uh, when, when I talked earlier about building capacity and shop space, I did mention that animal science is probably uh, the one shop that, well, frankly, if it wasn't designed into the original plans because we rolled out animal science after as we were going through the building project itself. The plan 
at the time was, well, we'll see if we can get a partner that'll join us and we can renovate this particular building and house the, uh, house the animal science program. There was some discussion about that. Um, it never actually materialized for whatever reason. So right now, um, we had to pivot on, 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 on that for the time being. So we, Minuteman also owns three houses on the back side of the building, residential units. Um, so we, we renovated one of those houses to accommodate animal science. They just moved into that space uh, after February um, vacation. And it's, it's going to be a good temporary solution for them. It frees up some um, space within the building that we can use for classrooms, um, restore some shop space in the horticulture area, and it gives animal science their own space. But it, again, it's only temporary. Um, we did issue a, a request for a uh, for proposal for, uh, again, a partnership to see if there were uh, any other interested parties that were in the vets, the vet, uh, veterinarian space, be it uh, uh, running clinics or hospitals or colleges to see if there was an interest in a partnership. We received uh, no interest on that. So um, at this point, and, and again, this will probably be something the new superintendent will have to give some consideration to, but um, if we're able to, you know, fund up to three or three point two million dollars in our capital stabilization account, and we're able to match that with a million to a million five of um, uh, capital skills grant money that's out there eligible for this type of work. If we have about four point five million dollars that we could do, we could probably renovate three thousand square feet of that of that property and um, create the space for animal science. It's a sixteen thousand square foot space. So whatever else happens is probably more for a future discussion. But I do think there's an immediate concern for animal science, and that's why I've been so aggressive about trying to fund this capital stabilization account. Not to mention the fact that the building is deteriorating on us right now because we haven't put any money into that. And we need to, we need to do sidings, we need to do the roof over. Uh, the bones are very, are, are very good on the building. But we just doing nothing is not the answer. So uh, we're working with our architect to see what we can get for four four million four point five million dollars. But in my mind right now, on the animal science program, frankly, uh, I think we're uh, we're not delivering on what we're selling. It just we really it's it's such a uh, the interest level is. Uh, through the roof in it, our instructors are fabulous. We're just not providing them the, the, the clinical space that they need to really do an effective job uh, with the students. And I, I just feel as though that that needs to be addressed, um, which is why I'm being so aggressive on the, uh, on the capital stabilization recommendation, which is what caused that spike in that particular line item. So um, that's how I see it. Again, I'm not gonna be here for the full story, but I think you know, I do think that uh, there, there is some consensus for the school from the school committee that we have to do something about the animal science program uh, in order to to improve uh, the space that they're using. And, and um, I think that's in, not to mention that we do have to take care of the building itself. I'll Questions, stop. Questions, Al Jones and Charlie. Uh, you mentioned it was constructed by students. Yes. Would most of the renovation be done by students? Uh, depends. I, I wouldn't see us, our kids doing roofing or anything like that. There may be an opportunity for, for them to do work. Uh, they did some work when we did this, the, the residential home over at Mill Street, which is helpful. It's always good to see students get involved in those types of work, in those types of programs. Thank you, Chair. I, I think I think that the school has a choice here <clears throat> between uh, channeling the uh, ESCO stranded asset money either to OPEB or to this building. I mean, that, that, that 500,000 a year on the, on the ESCO would, would finance an $8 million renovation uh, pretty handily. And um, if, th if this is really a serious issue, that might be one way to handle it without having any impact on, uh, on the member assessments. 
No, it's a fair, that's a, that's a fair alternative. We can certainly talk about that with the school committee. Um, I, I just did not think that that would require us to go off of funding under that proposal, Kelly. We, we'd have well, you have it, 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 but it wouldn't have a it, it wouldn't have an impact on your uh, uh, assessment rate because you're spending that uh, right now on on that lease program. And when the lease drops off, that's sort of in, in your base. Understood. Uh, but we'd have to bond it. We have to finance yeah, it, and that'd be the debt service. So that means we'd have to go out and get agreement of all nine member towns that uh, that this is our plan. Um, it would be a sell, but I'm sure that you know we can we can certainly demonstrate that you know it's already in the budget. But um, I just don't think that there's an appetite out there based upon some of the meetings I've been to as far as authorizing more debt for Minuteman. Right. And it only takes one to say no. <laughs> I will note too that of the 550, there are the 16 um, old member towns that are paying. So that it's only about 425 that are the, the nine member towns. Oh, so so some of, some of it would fall through to the, to the current budget, but some of it will just go away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Some is being paid by the, the previous. Thank you. John? Um, yeah, just, I'm just noticing that final bullet there that says we'll not add additional seats or capacity. And uh, I just wonder how does that work? In other words, you know, assume everyone's there now, we're going to add a new building. And uh, is there any way that that could be reconsidered or is there any kind of leeway there? Because it just seems like you have such a popular program just in general and, you know, you'd have no problem filling these seats. You could fill these seats probably uh, find twice as many people to fill each one of these seats. Um, you know, is there any kind of scalability, in other words, when you look at that building, maybe you, I'm just throwing it out there, maybe you ask for more money, but you can increase capacity, and all of a sudden the revenue is going to go up. Is, is, so back to that final bullet, is that, is that locked in stone, or, or is there some uh, leeway there? Well, we can, only, we can only accommodate so many students per program. So um, I think we're at capacity in that program. Uh, what, what this is intended to deliver is that over the last couple of years, there had been some discussion about probably trying to see if we can increase enrollment to 725, maybe even 800 with a number of different uh, suggestions that might or might not work. Um, Minuteman, at least at this moment, in my mind, isn't ready to be looking at any level of capacity enrollment expansion right now. Um, I just I, I just don't see how we could accommodate it. I can see, however, if we do a complete renovation of that building at some point, moving some of our other shops that aren't necessarily shops, but they're more classroom labs, say engineering or robotics or design and visual communications, where if we created uh, those types of spaces in that building, which would then create more space in the main building that could be perhaps used for classrooms. That's a potential, but I don't think we have the funding there right now to, 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 to make that reach in the shop in the, in, as of right now. So what I'm looking for is, a, is, a, is what I think is a, a, an, immediate, an immediate need and recommendation to try and accommodate that. Yeah. Certainly the new superintendent can look at the potential of that of that building and how that could perhaps best uh, uh, increase capacity or yeah. Uh, so there's constraint in addition to space and building constraints. There's also I assume just faculty constraints and things like that. You can, even if you increase the building space, there's other constraints as well. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think that uh, we we would have to move things around. I, I think the, maybe the, the largest hurdle right now would be the funding issue. Um, but no, wouldn't, the, when I, wouldn't the funding maybe take care of itself if you, if you were able to bring in another, and I'm just, you know, an, an additional, you know, 20 to 30 kids, wouldn't the funding take care of itself? Yeah, I, I'd have to run the model, but, yeah. um, you know, I, I think the estimate that the architect gave us as far as how much it's costing to renovate these days is somewhere around a thousand bucks a square foot. Yeah. For a commercial space with equipping, so it, it's it's a rather significant uh, undergo, under, uh, undertaking. Yeah. 
Thank you. So just to kind of wrap it up um, in our operating capital, we, we sort of summarized this before. Uh, you'll see the difference in the in the capital equipment line of 422,000 of which 350 is the recommendation on the stabilization account. But overall, the operating capital budget's a total of 3.96%. If we can go to the next slide, please. We'll see um, where that discrepancy on that uh, chapter 70 line, where we're showing FY24 at 2.1, where it's probably closer to 2.9. It's really showing an $800,000 difference, but that $800,000 we did get, we just simply didn't include it in our budget. So that's what's kind of skewing uh, the assessment, bringing it down to a 0.82%. You'll also see the, the decrease in the uh, non-resident capital fee. Um, and you'll see the, the change in the uh, with the addition of the facilities rental revolving revenue for the debt service associated uh, with the athletic fields. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, you'll see the breakdown by uh, assessment components, uh, where uh, the state the state assigned minimum required contributions up nine percent, uh, transportation reimbursement up about twelve percent. Uh, again, the capital and lease we talked about, um, and the uh, and the uh, in the assessments over minimum contributions, where we see a decrease. So the total assessments are 0.82%. Well, I think that's uh, that wraps up our comments. We'd be happy to answer any remaining questions that you might have. What other questions do people have? Al Jones and Charlie? Yeah, talk a little bit about the co op program. I'll, you know, what, what the incentive of it is, um, I don't see any, you know, are there any cost implications that if uh, there's room to expand it to increase capacity? Um, the co-op program is, is, is basically a result of partnerships that Minuteman has in the different trade industries um, and, and with local businesses. If, provides opportunities for students that can that can begin in their junior year and into their senior year to work co-op. Um, the only the only cost associated with it is basically the coordinator who's, who's coordinating all of these assignments. Um, and I, I think it really adds value to the educational experience that we have at Minuteman. Uh, some of the barriers for some of the students relate to transportation. You know, some students may not have the ability to, 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 to get to work or not. Other students um, may not be ready to try the workforce yet, particularly some of our juniors. Um, and then there are those that simply like school. They want to play sports. They want to do that type of thing. So you, you, you can't do co-op and then but not show up for sports. Every Roughly how many week. students are involved in that? Um, I want to say about 100. Well, that's quite a few. Yeah. Do are they do they are they still assessed for full tuition? Oh sure. They yeah. <clears throat> yep. So are, are the school's costs lower for the co-op? Well, like they're taking a seat. I mean, you know, they're, they're still our students. It's just that they're not in the classroom. They're not in the job that week. So okay. and right. we can't backfill them on the assumption that they're you know, we can't backfill students because First of all, they're in their junior and senior year. We're not taking any students in at, in the, right. at those grade levels, so um, it's mostly just an enhancement to their. Uh, okay, I was wondering with 100 students, I was wondering if that was essentially an increase in capacity without taking a desk space. Yeah, no. And given the 19 air majors that we have, those those 100 students are spread throughout the different areas, so you, you don't really get that. Uh, that, that bank for our, uh, in terms of space, because it's it, it, the shops, again, with the exception of the animal science, the shops are fine from a capacity perspective. It's, it's our classroom space that really presents the challenges, primarily in the freshman year, because in, the, in freshman year, our, uh, our freshman students, instead of rotating uh, one week academic, one week shop, like the upperclassmen, they, they do English and math um, every week 
in preparation for their MCAS. And we found that strategy to be a very successful uh, uh, way of delivering curriculum. And that's what causes the backlog on classrooms. But we, we wouldn't be able to see any real benefit because as a result of the co-op placements. From a, from a capacity issue, we certainly see it from a, a, the experience of students gain. That's sort of interesting because my new neighbor is uh, on the board of uh, Artists for Humanity, which is sort of a job shop for high school designer. And then it, it seemed like there was an increase in all the media design and visual design and things like that. But I didn't know if you have any affiliation with Artists for Humanity. But and, uh, you know, again, it's putting kids out and, and you know, paid jobs without taking a seat in the, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Can make a note to find out where our advisory board composition is Great. for that, and we can find out whether that organization is part of our advisory board for that shop. Yes, thank yeah. you. Artists for Humanity. Artists for Humanity. Uh, I guess. Thank you. Yeah. I'll find it. Okay. Harold. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, uh, Superintendent Mahoney, you mentioned. That uh, this is this year's uh, reduction in the assessment is something that we can't expect in the future. That there's going to be increases and in, mentioned several different categories where we're going to see these impacts in the future. Uh, it might be a good idea going into town meeting to have a maybe a five year projection and starting with you know fiscal 24, and then we suddenly have this drop in 25 due to the factors that you mentioned. And, and then set the expectation for people to have some modest increases, realistic increases going forward. And that should reduce the sticker shock impact next year when you come back with an increase. It doesn't have to be too detailed a chart, you know, I mean, it could right. have three or four yeah. lines in it. Thanks for the suggestion. Michael? Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Nikki, for the customarily detailed and lucid presentation of a lot of numbers, a lot of information. Um, I remember it took the theater a long time to get fully equipped with the uh, hardware that it needed. Is the theater fully up and running now? Yes. Great. That is great news. Um, the uh, expiring lease on the uh, abandoned assets to escrow. There'll be a lot of demands on that money, I imagine, when, when that lease is, on, on that budget line, when that lease is fulfilled. Um, with, with all consideration to my colleague, I would advise holding firm on the plan of devoting that to OPEB, because OPEB is a very unsexy liability to fund. I think there are other options uh, that could be employed um, in terms of public and private partnerships and many, so many others in, in rehabilitating some deteriorating uh, physical space on campus. Uh, options that just, just are not available to, to something as nerdy and, and in the weeds as, as OCAP liability. Um, what percentage of field rev uh, field revenue versus versus the uh, interest payments on the borrowed money to complete the field project are the uh, revenues received from field rev from from field rentals covering that now or not? Yes. Oh, yeah. It's it is. It's that fund's making money right now. Damn, that's good. That's but 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 again, when if if we do move forward with Wesley, our projections would suggest that it's going to be just about right even. Yeah, I'm a little bit concerned when you mentioned Leslie and in concern, concerned, very disappointed, but thankful for some very honest comments from you about the animal sciences. These were public private partnerships that were well advertised, trumpeted, and I fact, in fact, the animal sciences partnership was actually announced. And then it fell apart. And now we can't get respondents to the RFP. Correct. That is very disappointing. Um, the, um, the concrete slab that started out as, as the ad, as the extra piece of the building project and was later deemed, was that the North building? Correct. Going to be, how is that going? Uh, it's the, the contract, it, the North building is a, it's, it's an adjacent building to our welding shop where we're putting some of our larger welding equipment in. 
uh, we had it, uh, the, the uh, shell of the building was, was done by a, a contractor who just uh, signed over the building to Minuteman. And right now our students are putting in the heating and the venting uh, for the, uh, in the duct work for all of that uh, internal uh, climate control. Mm -hmm. And uh, we expect that'll be done by the end of the school year. So the building will be able to be occupied next, next school year. <clears throat> and that space will come online. Yes. Excellent. Um, there was talk uh, for a number of years on contesting the amount of money paid to the town of Lincoln in building permit fees that uh, in the school committee's view, the town of Lincoln had charged wholly exor exorbitant amounts uh, for the building permits on the building and uh, way beyond what the actual costs of doing the inspections and approving the work would ever have been. And to keep the building uh, program on calendar, Minuteman decided to pay those amounts and defer the question of, of contesting them until later. Where does that stand up? I don't have an update on that right now. It's $2 million, Kevin. Do we know where that's going? I don't have an update on that right now. Okay. Um, so from all that you've said, the idea that had been publicly announced it and discussed it in a number of fora of eventually getting the um, per capita enrollment up to 800, that doesn't seem to be operable now, does it? Not in the near future. I don't see that. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, last question. Presume that there was a settlement offered and accepted by the previous superintendent to terminate the final two years of the contract to which she had been hired. How much did that cost? It's a public document. Do we have it? Well, with whatever we have, it's fine. It's public. So um, I know that there was uh, a salary settlement, and there may have been some other. Were there some other things? There was. Um, sure, you can give it to me. Yep. Um, so the salary settlement was um, for this year ending June thirtieth, um, two hundred thousand um, dollars, which uh, was the agreed upon salary, and as well as health insurance benefits. Um, of twelve thousand five hundred twenty-eight dollars. That was for one year of salary. Was there for the second year of the contract? Was was there a settlement for the third year of the contract? No, that was a, that was a full settlement. But you do, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate all the information. So, uh, Rebecca, and then you. Thank you. Um, I had a question about this hundred percent acceptance rate from Arlington for ninth grade for next year, which I think is fantastic. On the one hand, like I think. Everyone is glad to hear that the Arlington kids who want to go to Minuteman are accepted. Um, but I'm wondering about how that fits in with um, special education, given that in the past, you know, my understanding was that there are special education programs that Arlington High can offer that aren't available at Minuteman. And so I'm wondering if you took all of the kids, is there a risk that some of those kids, you're going to look at their IPs in a couple months and be like, we don't actually have the programs for these kids? Or do you feel like, they were counseled ahead of time on the special education that Minuteman can offer? Well, uh, our admissions pro uh, policy uh, process is sped blind. Yeah. So we don't know which students are coming in with IEPs. So uh, we'll get that information over the summer. We can typically accommodate most of the students that go through our uh, admissions process fairly well. I think this year there were maybe two or three that we had to re uh, send back to the ascending district just because we couldn't. Um, so there's always that risk, but we don't know that at this stage of the game, it's a little later in the process so we'll, that those uh, those areas would be identified. Would you be open to you know, serving the kids that have been accepted if they have needs that you don't currently, like what if you took a kid whose IEP coming from Arlington says they need a one-on-one -on -one aid? Like, what would you do? Do you? I, I can't. I can't. Right place? I, I'm sorry. I can't address specific uh, those types in that level of uh, detail. Um, but 
what I do know is if we can't accommodate a student, if we're doing a student a disservice by just trying to keep the student in, and it's, 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 it's not in the best interest of the student. We do try. Um, but, and again, like I said, maybe three or four this year. So, and the whole school, yeah. not out. So it's. I'm just curious because I think in the past, maybe some of that was addressed during admission. And so if the kids, do you know what I mean? Like during the admissions process, some of the kids who weren't offered a slot at Minutemen was because they didn't have the right program for them. So if you took all the kids, I think on the one hand, I think that's a great sign, but I'm if, 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 what will happen if their needs are too high. If after the student was accepted and it was identified that it, there wasn't, uh, it wasn't a good fit, then maybe that's the case. But as of right now, in June, uh, I'm sorry, February 15th, with our acceptance cutoff, there's been no consideration for any type of special education services by those 175, by those 210 students who were invited to, uh, to, uh, to apply. Thank you. I guess I'll direct my question at our, uh, our school committee rep is Monica, so I can raise the professional staff out of it. Um, do you want to tell us how the superintendent search is going? Superintendent search is going wonderfully. I was able to share with the Arlington Select Board that we um, made an offer to one of our three final candidates. Everything was fully vetted with, in accordance with Massachusetts open meeting law, and we made the offer publicly. The chair and the vice chair of the search committee stepped out made the phone call offer and she accepted and we're in negotiations now. Other questions? Josh. Um, I have a, just a few random questions. <clears throat> um, based on like the 19 different fields and some of you, you mentioned that your students are doing the HVAC and stuff and now you asked about solar. Is there like which which of the programs, if we save it, would be if we get back to climate change, which of the programs would those students be going into? Where do you try and guide guide students at all? It's climate change. I would think you know this. It could range to a number of different programs that we have. Either you know, environmental, environmental science would be yeah. among them. Um, electrical. Awesome. Um, some of those areas. So it is really interesting question. But not, not like specifically heat pumps, solar yeah. installation, yeah. Uh, yeah. that and kind of thing. Engineering, environmental, yeah. electrical, uh, even even plumbing to some extent. I would right. think that's where you see some of that. But have you thought about creating a program for specifically for those kinds of trades? My understanding is that a lot of those, the, there are certain units that involve the, the, those types of um, uh, uh, you know, climate change related topics right. that they address as part of their uh, part of the training and right. jobs. Um, <clears throat> let's see my other end questions. Um, just get, if you could remind me during COVID, did you close down or, or was it remote or fully in person or what was it? Um, for the when COVID hit, it was remote. Um, that next fall, we opened up at certain intervals in accordance uh, with was recommended. So um, at some points, there was alternating uh, classes, and it was you know twenty five percent capacity. Right. And then it slowly went to fifty percent capacity, seventy five percent capacity. Right. I think that's similar to what we did. Yeah. Our... Yeah. I'll just add from the parent perspective because my son was a sophomore right. when it happened. Is that um, Minuteman was equipped with Microsoft Office mm -hmm. Teams and was able to pivot right. super fast. Right. That's which, as a parent, yeah. made us happy. Yeah. Made my husband and myself very happy. Okay. I guess partly what's driving my questions is the the um, the withdrawals over two of those grades, like 22, 23, 24, seem to have fairly peak numbers going back to our own time. So if we looked at those like a percentage of the class, yeah, it I, almost seems like 40 or 50% turned back to our own high from our own. Um, so it's 
it's hard to say because it's you know over a four year span, but um, you know I did talk to our our data and communications um, director, and there was some um, there was some communication or uh, you know response that you know maybe a virtual shop wasn't for that mm -hmm. student, so mm -hmm. that could have been part of the reason um, why they decided to return to an academic school. Um, just not, you know, really doing that hands on. I know that, you know, they did work to try to do some, you know, virtual sure. um, shop. Uh, I don't know, did your son have any experience with uh, virtual shops? I think virtual it shops is hard for any student, any teacher when you're trying to do hands on. So there were a lot of software tools that all of the teachers utilized to get that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of visual modeling and things that you can do. And then um, what was nice is that in the summertime, they ran um, labs or extra hours to offer to families so that the students could come in and get that hands-on practical work. And everybody signed up for it. And the students were like, yeah, I, I need it. I mean, my son was like, mom, can I do sophomore year over? We sort of that global, can I do it over? I mean, the way that all the students felt, right? It was tough on all the students. So. Yeah, I think you're right, particularly for the kind of stuff you're offering. Promote would be especially mm -hmm. difficult. Um, okay, and then just like from a selfish finance committee perspective, the way I understand the funding is like whatever our Arlington enrollment is as of October 1st, that's what we're kind of paying for, whether those students leave or not. Correct. And I, I will clarify um, the five students that I mentioned prior that was students that entered in after October 1, uh, entered, in. entered into. So not necessarily withdrew, but um, there was a follow-up question. Were their seats replaced with somebody else? Five students, none from Arlington, entered in after October 1, which shows the limited amount entering in after, um, despite withdrawals um, coming out. You know, we do anticipate and sometimes take in excess um, anticipating the 5% um, kind of drop off throughout the year. Um, but that uh, I wanted to clarify, uh, especially because you had that question um, in relation to the withdrawals. Um, so the next following fiscal year, even though, you know, you have paid for that slot, um, the next October 1 number won't count to that spot. And that's across the board for all of our Right. Um, right. But I, I mean, again, it's 38000 per student or whatever. It's still it's not nothing. It was five or 10 or whatever. Yes. Well, like, how is that managed just from an emotional kind of guidance perspective? Do you work with your own high school guidance department or do you try and push people to make a decision before October 1st so that we can kind of have them in the right seat at the right time? Push them in what we got. Well, it, it, like I know sometimes I miss a deadline and all of a sudden I lost out on some financial opportunity because I missed a deadline. In this case, if they were if they withdrew act after on October 2nd, then Arlington is kind of on the hook for their seat, right? Whereas if they withdrew on September 29th, they wouldn't be. So I'm just wondering like what happened. Uh, I'm sure that's a very busy time of the year, but I'm just wondering how, you know, how, how much effort you put into making sure that the fit is right in that first month. Well, I mean, it's it's ultimately up to the student and the family. Sure. I mean, we're not targeting a deadline yet from a funding perspective. This is a this is a personal decision. So, I would say that the two are mutually exclusive. Okay. All right. Anything That's else? All I have. Thank you. Done, Charlie. The clarification um, <clears throat> from a funding perspective. Don't you calculate the uh, assessments based on the rolling average of the students of the town? Yes, because they on a, a four year right. rolling average. Yeah, so that That's what right. happens to one or two well, students on October 1st doesn't really affect the funding in any major way. The, the four year rolling average helps to you know spread it out. So if you see a big increase one year, um, it's kind of spread out more amongst um, you know future fiscal. Budget, so I, I wouldn't say there's an immediate impact on, on one or two students, um, but you know certainly I understand the, the question. Other questions, Rebecca. Um, thank you. Just as a follow-up, again, 
sorry to hard, sorry to get stuck on the sex child with first question, but this is really something I'm trying to understand. Um, of the kids, not who transfer into Minuteman, but kids who transfer out of Minuteman to Arlington High School during the academic year, do you have a sense for how many of those kids, I don't know what words you use, but like, if they're in good standing or on track to pass their classes, or how many of them are having like attendance problems, for example? Um, that, I wouldn't know the answer to that. Yeah, that's not data uh, we have available. I, I wouldn't know the answer to that. I don't think we would. I don't. I'm just. I. I'll, I don't have any answer to it, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to venture to try. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Maybe we can have an email. Yeah, I can. Um, we can take it offline, and I can certainly um, work with our our data analyst and our um, admissions group to see what kind of data um, we do uh, have. And if it's not something we have, it could be something that we look onto the future to track. Any other questions? Nothing more. Do you have anything you want to add, or have you covered everything to your satisfaction? Oh, thank you for your time. We yeah. really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and um, I think the collaboration kind of across the town um, with all of us at Minuteman has been really terrific. And um, there's a lot of admiration. Al and Kevin have known one another for a long time. There's a lot of longstanding relationships. Um, and that really helps. And I have a regular cadence where I'm talking to the select board of Arlington. And um, so that's, I think that collaboration has, as a new new kid on the block, if you will, for the school committee, it's been really welcoming. It's good to hear. Mm -hmm. well, all right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time, everyone. Okay. Let's push waiting off off for the minutes. Okay, and then we can get you to send that Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Take the rest of the night off. <laughs> I'm going home to do laundry out. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> Take care. Okay, so we have um, minutes from the fourth and the sixth. So since I last sent these out, I did add the read class documents that Carolyn had sent out, but and that's I haven't received any other comments. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Anybody notice any other changes, revisions that we need to make to the minutes of March 4th? Right. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of March 4th? So um, moved. Is there second. a second? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So, first, I'm not sure what to do. I was only here for half the meeting. Uh, you have to decide. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. If you if you want to abstain, I will abstain. All right, all, all, abstain, all, right. all in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. In the affirmative. Any opposed? Abstain. Abstentions. Two abstentions. Okay. Oh, and Mike and Dean are out in the hall. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Right here for the vote. Okay. Yeah, Carol, okay. And Rebecca. Rebecca, yeah. Rebecca, yeah. 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 Rebecca and yeah. it was 10 for two abstaining for missing the vote. So it's 10 0 2. Yeah. Right. The minutes of the six. Okay. This was a half of winning night. Right. Anyone uh, have any revisions to the minutes of the sixth? All right, is there a motion? So moved. Second. All right, all in favor, raise your hand. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. In the affirmative, any opposed? 
Any abstentions? Of course, I ask for a hand raised for that one. <laughs> okay, and then three, three missing the. All right. Um, budget. Let's do. Um, that the resource. Uh, so we have some clarity. Um, so it appears that the Park and Rec Department um, is contributing about thirty-five thousand year to the field maintenance. Um, and that, but weirdly, they see that as a calendar year, not a budget year, not our budget year. So because that's how the fees are that's a, oh, because that's how the fees are paid. So so they can direct 35,000, but when it goes to the munis, it might look a little different depending on how the, those things come out. Um, but the numbers that we that I originally presented to you for how much and the actuals for field maintenance, uh, then are just the DPW now. Yeah. yeah. So, so I want to recommend that uh, we move thirty thousand from natural resources to field maintenance. Twenty thousand of that is the amount that was just a mistake. It was supposed to be in field maintenance, right? and it was just sort of put in the wrong place. Ten thousand is the amount that uh, is over. Um, more than just reason historical average for overtime. Um and and Mike Bredecker has agreed to that so that the field maintenance would come out to 90k, which is still doesn't really cover what we're paying, but it's a little bit closer, a little more, more honest. So my recommendation is that we approve the um research and research budget at one million eight hundred nineteen thousand two hundred eighty-one. Right, and hold on, hold on, hold on, we'll say the number again. We're going to take natural resources first. Okay. We're going to, we're, we'll vote on a, a number for that. For make for natural resources. For so, natural that, resources so that's the number then, I just said for natural resources. And then we'll okay. Then we'll vote, vote the field, field maintenance. Okay. Can you say the number again? Yeah. One million eight hundred nineteen thousand two hundred eighty-one. Thirty thousand left in the budget, and and that is coming out of out of the additional twenty thousand that's in the maintenance line, which as I said was a mistake, and out of the overtime five one zero three. Yeah. And that still leaves overtime a little bit higher than left after I approved, and but it's just slightly modest. Right. So if we were probably staffed over our numbers would go up. That's a whole issue. So leaving some wiggle room there is not a bad idea. So you have a motion. So well, one eight one nine two eight nine has it been seconded? Okay. So, um, everyone is clear. We're reducing the natural resources budget by thirty thousand dollars. Twenty thousand will be taken out of the maintenance five two zero two line, and ten thousand from the overtime line. That's that's my All right. Any questions, John? Uh, just remind me, I was discussed at the lot B, but generally the, the 5299, the um, maintenance fields, so now it's up to 90. Is that like, uh, so is that supplies or is that contractor fees? Uh, so that is, we're contracting now. So that's for people to come in, mow the lawn, or, you know, that but don't work. Right. Nice all right. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 And um, Park might used to cover a little bit more than they do now. But they still cover about thirty five thousand. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? All right. All in favor of natural resources at one eight one nine two eight one say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Unanimous. I don't think there's any second recommendation. And I think we just had an idea of this last discussion, but um, 
team. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, we got the message from several people that our parks sort of are just overused. We have to do them for the number of people. And so it's not really a throw money at the problem issue, but it's more of, you know, would it be really get good, you know, field that we'd have to let them hang out for a while. That, that was a claim made by several people. Yeah, Drug right. because a lot of other people started. Yeah, you're right. but, yeah, so that was, yeah. But, okay. Um, okay, so my recommendation for uh, making plant field is um, to fund that at 90,000. I'm sure how much? 90,000? 90, 90, 90. Mm -hmm. Been a motion to consent. Of it. Any questions? I'll do. This isn't really a question, but I mean, the, the, I, I agree with these changes, but it doesn't really resolve the issue of the inconsistency and in the yeah. structure of the budgets and fiscal year and things like that. Do we want to pursue or plan to pursue that at all? So, which inconsistency? Because there's a couple. Well, just you know, <laughs> Joe's got his own budget and the manager's got their own. They never seem to match. Yeah, I think Rebecca can actually uh, okay. talk about it. Um, just briefly, so we spoke to Joe, and in fact, yes, as, as he mentioned, there is a revolving fund. It just appears the select board votes directly on them. And they've already approved these revolving funds. So I added the entire list of revolving funds uh, from the select board report. I added them under the rec department budget if you'd like to look at them. And so, yeah, he said they have a, you know, they have a balance in the account of about $16,000, and they do, in fact, take in some Field fees when it's spent as yeah, about 30, about 30, 30, 30, 30. each year. But but there was like a year where it was 70,000 because in our fiscal year, their calendar is spending in the Right. Year. I just want to, if we can take the Joe's budget and the manager's budget and put them side by side, can we reconcile them without a secret piece of paper? I don't think it works quite like that. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, so the there's a bunch of field fees going into this revolving fund that doesn't yeah. show in either budget. Right. And then money's coming out of that revolving fund to be spent on the fields. Right. Wasn't the revolving fund something like retained earnings? No. This is a separate revolving fund that has yeah. nothing to do with Joe's retained earnings. I don't, I don't I know if the timing matters all that much. I think from my experience, what happens yeah. with these field fee funds is um, and it's both on the town and the school side. They're I'm going to call it the way they get collection of their money is they withhold your permits for the next usage of it, right? So, like, um, if if a user group were to rent out, um, we would get permits for town fields for the rent, right? Um, and they don't pay the ten dollars per fee permit. The town just they chase, they chase, they chase, but then when you get your permit for the next season, they don't. They don't give it to you. That, that, it's not just pushes yeah. it back. It the timing isn't my concern. So just, I mean, I, the, the bottom lines match. It's just nothing else ever seems to match. It just bothers me. So, what so I want to know is that they. The, 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 the DPW budget numbers yeah. don't actually bounce around a lot. They're just going steadily up. And they're now about 111,000. So, okay. so, we just, um, DPW keeps paying more and more percentage, uh, or the prices keep going up. Park Mart is paying about 35000 a year, price is going up, and DPW is probably more than that. And that's just what happened. Their, their numbers are really bounced up and down. It's, it's very messy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Topher? Yeah, so you said yeah. they pay about 35000 each year. Yeah. And then I'm just confused because Alex's email, I mean, it showed in FY22 it was about that, but in FY23 it was like eight to the six, or is this just another number that's not really related to the 35,000. Right, so this um, is this email? The email that he sent to you. Okay, customers. this one? Um, little so, chart that we made. So, John for maintenance, CW is this, the long time maintenance. Oh, yeah, so FY23, I, I, I assume we'll see that in FY24. Um, but when you look at, when, when you look at their calendar year budget, it's it's pretty consistent. I, I don't know I don't know why it's not even because I assume that it'll show up in FY twenty. And you're saying this is a, a this number. is a fiscal year bucket in right. it's right. not the right. 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 but but the yeah, but, but DBW's numbers are not going up and down, they're just steadily going up. 
No, it's just, just there's got to be another way. Other other questions? All right, so there's a motion um, for 90000 for field maintenance. Is that a second it? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so other than what? Oh, I just want to take up my yeah. hand. Yep, yep. I just want to, um, we'll take we'll do that next. I just want to say that I think we were done with all budgets except insurance, insurance. and water and sewer. And I was told today that there are numbers out. It's just so well. So, what happens is they get the raw numbers and then, then it. Human resources has to crunch stuff. And so it takes them a few days to do that. So we've moved our meeting up from the 20th to the 19th. If a number of people have said yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and so we'll meet on Tuesday the 19th at uh, 8.30 to 10.30. And um, then we'll present on the 20th in case during the course of our conversation, um, they need to make any changes. You know, we now have a buffer of 24 hours to do that. Well, actually, a little more than 24 hours. So, that is. All right. Yes. So, let's plan on doing those two budgets on the 20th. And I'll make I sure. I plan on attending just to, it'll be worth the two hours just to walk out with the documents <laughs> rather than chase them for two, for three okay. or four hours like last week. Okay. Well, I'll or I'm going to keep you on the email. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's take that minute, man. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to recommend favorable action on improving the uh, assessment. Uh, and I get three things I'd like to point out. Uh, two superintendents, one, two superintendents ago, superintendent uh, promised that if we support the field, the new uh, field maintenance. Uh, agreements and field creation that if we pay the debt service for the first year because they don't have any maintenance, any uh, fees coming in, then for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the time, the revolving fund at man would pay that. The next superintendent either didn't remember or wasn't told that. And so she promised uh, last spring that if there's any increase in local aid over the uh, governor's original recommendation, uh, she would make sure that goes back. This superintendent, who I've known for like 30 years, made all that happen. Uh, no arguments, no let's figure out some place to spend the money. Just he knew about the two promises and he made sure that they were carried forth. So uh, the field debt service is off our assessments now. And the increase in the fiscal this year's fiscal state aid uh, is being returned to the uh, members um, in reduced assessments. And then the third thing is uh, we're getting a five percent decrease in our fiscal twenty five assessments. I can't remember the last time that happened. Uh, you know they 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 get all this extra money. They could have really gung gung ho and spent it. Um, but whether through Kevin or through um, wherever they didn't, they basically gave it all back and reduced our assessments and modified the others. The ups and downs of each town vary according to the enrollment, but still, uh, you know, they they carried through all the promises they made to us. Uh, they reduced our assessments. I think they're taking some long term uh, steps to reduce their future uh, um, their future liabilities and uh, OPEB and capital. And uh, so I think we should support that. They're still an expensive school and I, I, um, I'm i glad that they face that head on. And I think most of the things that, you know, the things that Kevin said were, were correct, uh, but I'll keep beating on them. <laughs> uh, and I think that any suggestions you have uh, coming out of this meeting, please go home and write them down and shoot me an email because when uh, Kevin um, is going back on June 30th to golf and the beach, uh, <laughs> and I'm gonna make, try to make an appointment to see the next superintendent as soon as possible 
and I'd like to have a whole series of things that we would like them to do. Um, I think this was a lot of great questions, and uh, but getting back, I recommend favorable action on the uh, budget and the assessments. So, okay. any discussion? Michael. Yeah, Kevin's a wealth of knowledge, especially in getting things to happen, and we all appreciate that. The animal science shop has serious problems. It was conceived under totally different conditions and sold to student uh, applicants as something much more hands-on and clinically based than it is right now. And Metaman has failed in establishing a partnership with the clinicians that would make that happen. Minuteman has structural asset that is literally falling down because they haven't been able to achieve the partnership or any other means to rehabilitate it. And yeah, they could have taken the excess this year and plowed it all back in. That would have been my choice. Um, a lot of good things happening there. It rubs me raw that for two and a half years, the school has looked at $2 million in excess building permit fees charged by the town of Lincoln and not done anything about it. They have dithered in pulling the trigger on what council has estimated would be a winnable case. And yet would cost money. Estimates, estimates provided to the school community in the past are about $50,000 in litigation costs. I would roll the dice any day on 50 grand for 2 million. They haven't done it. Kevin has the interim's freedom to state the truth, frankly and without collaboration. But I wish we'd heard more information on that point tonight. He fessed up to the fact that the animal sciences program is stuck in the mud. They have more kids who want to be in there. They have no space to put them. They have no collaborators. They're not giving the kids the experience that they see. And he has the insurance freedom to say so. Because like you said, what's going to happen at the end of the year to him? He retires. Uh, anyways, I, I am with you. I recommend, I recommend a passage of their budget item. And I hope to be part of those conversations with the next superintendent. Annie? Um, I'll pass. Chris, we got it. Any other comments or questions? All right. All in favor of the Minuteman assessment at 8562229, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Um, Let's do um, transfer of funds cemetery, Article 60. So um, there is a 240,000 offset in the cemetery budget coming from um, lots and grave and barrel. Capital is I think there's ten thousand from the months. Um, Jennifer, uh, is there a motion to um, transfer transfer two hundred forty thousand to the cemetery commissioners and ten thousand to the capital mm -hmm. budget from the state of Boston Is there a motion? And I'm not that. Okay, so part of the the 240,000 offset from um, that's in the cemetery budget comes from the sale of um, lots and graves. Um, so we need to uh, we need to approve the transfer from the sale the the, the fund um, from mm -hmm. fund containing um, money from the sale of lots and graves to the cemetery commissioners. For that offset, and then we also need to 
to the extent of 10,000 from that same fund they have to pay and help fund the capital budget, which is for headstone repair. So that's what our, we're doing with Article 16. So we just didn't look at our article setting. I assume it's good. I I'll make that motion. Yeah. All right. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay, so how much? 10,000 to capital? 10,000 to capital for a headstone repair, repair and 240,000 to the cemetery commission. Second. 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 Perpetual care is going to be like five point eight million. It's, it's a it's yeah, very, it's very high. Yeah, I'm looking right. at it right now, and I, no, just, it's some, I explained yeah. it, and now for some reason I'm second guessing myself. Um, hold on, Here, just make sure I'm looking at the right set of goals. Okay. Um, so um, I do. So two funds. Um, one is at one million forty-five thousand three hundred forty-seven. Yeah. And the other one is at eight million six hundred seventy-three thousand seven hundred ninety-two. Perpetual care is the eight million number, and lots and graves is okay. the one million. Number. And they're both higher than we're last year. Yes. So we're not we're not completely them yet. The sale of lots and graves, oh. which so at some point soon there's not going to be much going in, and, and more will be taken out than going right. In. But there's still that sort of like couple of remains that you know are still being filled. But yeah. a lot more, um, a lot more people are choosing to be uh, cremated, so they're going with the. Um, the <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. So something to look at for the future. Um, just keeping in uh, looking at the money's coming into. You're still earning a lot in interest, but obviously the sales may be going down in the future. No wonder we should get that media leap of the projection. I mean, if we're taking out two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, uh, and we've got eight or nine million, eight million dollars sitting there, project the interest rate, and yeah. the and revenue coming in. And the number's still going up. Still hopefully it'll be long after. Yeah. We've made our contributions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, curious, has anybody done any study like that? Or do we know how much approximate room is left um, for the act, for actual lots in uh, Mount? Oh, that's fine. Oh, yeah. But, I don't know. We can, I, we can ask next year. Yeah, we yeah. Can, yeah. unless you, anyway, really. $800 is going to throw off $250,000 a year. Yeah, I mean, we're, as I said, the, the amounts are so, still damp. The reserves are still damp. I don't think right. it's, I don't think it's. So where's the 250000 going to the capital plan? 240 no. goes to the cemetery commissioners, and, and 10 goes to the capital plan. And what are the cemetery commissioners going to do with it? Party. <laughs> Sorry, I'm spending if, money on the cemetery. And they're spending, yeah, they're funneling it back in to, for maintenance and yeah, pizza, the budget. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So that's not right. Well, it, is it the, the it's operating the budget? Yeah, yeah, it's the operating budget. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. what I thought it was. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed?
Yes. Um, uh, let's do uh, Article 61, the overlay reserve. I have a number, which is 750,000. So moved. Second. All right, so the motion to appropriate $750,000 for the overlay from the overlay reserve under Article 61. Any questions? Is this a revalue? No. No. Okay. But this is for the, this is to cover assessments of the additional assessments. It's, it's the standard or abatement. So assessment of abatement. It's always about seven hundred fifty thousand, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's years ago it was six hundred thousand, but it's always somewhere in that area. All right. Um, so there's been a motion and a second. Second. All right. All right. All in favor, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed. Unanimously. Um, on the front stabilization, yeah, let's do that. I don't know which. Article sixty two. I'm sorry. Okay, this is a non firm stabilization. Yeah, move 100,000. Second. Second. This is traditionally we put 100,000 into this fund every year. Jordan. Do we know uh, what the balance is in long term stabilization right now? Anybody have the uh, five year plan? Yeah. Yeah. Looks like uh, four point one million. Four million. Looks like four million two someplace in that range. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Do you have the motion seconded? Any other questions? Any? Do we know if there's a policy about a a range of money that should be in that fund? Like it shouldn't drop below and it shouldn't go above. I don't know. I think the target has usually been we never want it to go below 5% of the budget. Of the, yeah. And, uh, you know, the investment aid, credit rate agencies are, are looking for that as sort of a minimum. But of course, what happens is the override gets way, built up way high and then yeah, gone. Because $4 million is not 5% of the budget. No. Why would they, why would we need to have any money over stabilization? If we had spent the overall stabilization money, why would we need to have any money left over? No, no, this is not the override yeah, stabilization. This is, this is not the long term stabilization. Long term. Long term. Separate. Okay, yeah. The reserve fund. Yes. Okay. Where is the money being transferred from? The general fund. General fund. Okay. Is that the same for the overlay as well? So yes. Yes. Okay. All right, so there's a motion for 100,000 under Article 62. It's been seconded. Any other questions, Michael? Comes from okay. the general fund into in, into the long-term stabilization. Is that how the money would come back uh, uh, by by vote to get back into the general fund? Is that yeah. is that where it's yes. expected for that money to come back to? This is new money going into the fund, and hopefully we won't need it. And if we do, it come out the same way. It comes out the same way, except it needs a two thirds vote. Yeah, stabilization is the operative word. John, does this go through the current year budget in the uh, I think in the line for more articles? No, yeah, yeah, right. yeah thank you. Any other questions? All right, all in favor of 100,000 for article 62 say aye. Aye, aye. aye. any opposed?
How about the uh, OPEP? Which one was Charlie, which one of us did a bed this year? Goldberg. Yeah. No? No. Uh oh. Uh, uh, we ever act together? We may not. So if we do 500 raised in taxes, you don't know. Oh, well, we, can, we can we can throw it in with insurance, and I can deal with it between now and then. I used to deal with it. Um, I, I don't have the numbers in front of you. Well, uh, let's, the let's hold it. Trust fund. Yeah. Okay. Five hundred thousand under A. It's, it's, it's usually the same amount full year. Yeah. No, I think. Oh, it is. I think that's here. Six hundred fifty thousand. And in this and this year, the um, select board, as part of the override commitments, I believe, are throwing in another one hundred and fifty thousand. They do every year, right? Doesn't somebody else throw oh, in? No, no, no. There's a, this. I think she's saying this is an addition to no. that one hundred and fifty-five, okay. which was from the override previous. Okay. okay. It's just the other chair walking our miscellaneous. Has the health benefit the trust fund uh, been cleaned uh, out? Yeah. Yes. There's nothing left of that. So I think just six fifty five. Or is there something extra? Yeah. Okay, so I have it here. <laughs> so uh, from the non contributory retirement fund is five hundred thousand, uh one hundred and fifty five thousand. Um from the uh, with the historic agreement that we've had in the past, yeah. and then uh, from the recent override commitment, one hundred fifty thousand. So the total is eight hundred five thousand. So moved. Second. I second. Can you repeat that amount again, Charlie? <clears throat> so from the from the uh, the traditional. Money that we spent on the non contributory retirement fund, 500000 Okay. There's a select board agreement with retirees when they went from 10% to 15% on health insurance premiums uh, that they would put in 155000 a year into the OPEP. Okay. And then in the recent override, uh, which was about two years ago, I think, um, there was a commitment for $150,000 that went into OPEP. Okay, thank you. So the total is 805000 Any questions? Dean and then John. It's related. I'll get there. When, so we're going to get that. When are we supposed to be full funded on the pension side? I know it's not. Uh, 35, 2035, mm -hmm. I think it is. 34. 34, might be 34. And we are still ahead of the game by just a couple of years is what we've been doing since I started doing it 12 years ago. Or 2030. And that's what keep our AAA bond, which is a good reason to keep us ahead of the game on it. One of the primary drivers. Okay, so I just want to point out I think I think I pointed I know I pointed out in the past. So we're getting closer and closer to the day when a zero will show up the five year plan of the pension line, mm -hmm. and that the finance committee needs to probably decide on whether it wants to recommend letting that zero pass through, or to start funding an OPEP fund more aggressively. Um, I know we've kind of kicked it, right. um, but it's you know the current five year plan goes up to twenty twenty nine. Right. For the final four or five years, where we have to do something. Well, <clears throat> Charlie in the past has been all against it, but he's changed his mind. So, Charlie, do you want to speak to that a bit? Because you know better than I do, but I can speak to it a little bit. The um, Char Charlie has been in favor of spending the five hundred thousand dollars on the OPEB since about twenty years ago. Yes, and. Um, 
I've never been in favor of not spending the health insurance. Uh, I mean, the retirement mm -hmm. fund on OPEP. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never, never discussed it actually, uh, but I totally agree that we have to uh, fund the OPEP. Mm -hmm. And just like the uh, putting that five hundred thousand dollars, that we have a line item in the budget in in. Um, 2034, we will be spending um, contribution. I'm sorry, 2033. The last contribution uh, is the, the next to last contribution is about 26 million. Then the next year it's 5 million. So we have around 2033 or 2034 to decide what to do with that, that contribution. So we will have to continue to. Uh, pay a normal cost, which will come out to about five million a year. So it looks like we have the possibility of contributing twenty million to the open mm -hmm. in that year. In yeah. two thousand yeah. thirty-four. If we want to continue to spend the same amount that we spent in two thousand thirty-three, I think that's going to require, you know, a substantially larger discussion yeah. Um, yeah. amongst the. Select board and various people in the town. Okay. Anything else, Dean? Nope. John? Um, yeah, I was just going to ask do we know what the, the OPEP balance is in the reserve? Uh, oh, it will be on the side. Of it, uh, somewhere here it's 21.7 billion as of 2023. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, 20, it's 23 million. Yeah, but it's only, and, and if that's only 10% funder, so there's no mandate on, on it. Projections, right. projections right. health insurance costs, right. which go up and down a lot. Right. right. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right, seeing none, we have a motion for. Eight oh five, eight hundred five thousand dollars into the OPEP under Article Fifty Nine. So, second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Um. Cash. Let's do free cash. Article 63. Is there a motion? No. Looks like eight million nine forty one nine thirty six. Move yeah, I'll move it. Okay, what is that amount? I'm just reading off the five year plan and measure eight million nine four one nine three six. Basically, nine million. Yeah, have we verified the um, certified free cash in September? And I don't know. I think that it was. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming this is the certified amount seventeen million eight eight three eight seventy two. I'm assuming that's what the manager would have put in the. Yeah. All right, well, there's a motion that's been seconded. Any other questions? All right, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Um, brief update on. Article, 
Yeah. Um, the yes. Yes. senior citizen property tax exemption <clears throat> after meeting with us. Um, Dana Mann has said that they're rethinking um, going mm -hmm. forward with that. And so right now it's in sort of the limbo state right now. So, so, yeah. so do you have spend, anything else to? No, just don't spend time thinking about it. It's basically so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so he should get back to, to me if, if they want to go forward. Right now, I think uh, it's not. Because I, yeah, think, I think there will be questions if you guys want to go forward with it. Yeah. If he says, you know, thanks, then you know, you know. Um, you know. All right. So the town manager is coming in on Wednesday. Um, he'll talk about the uh, other warrant articles that we had questions about when we did our warrant review. Um, and um, be available for any other questions you might have. So I don't think we have anything else on Wednesday, correct? Nope, just them. Um, and then I'm over. Well, I was going to say the DPW project is you going to talk about that. Yes. Well, he, he can, yes. I came from Boston. Yeah, and he's aware of that. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, um, and then Monday is the phone. We, we have a busy night Monday. We have water bodies and the Conservation Commission coming in first thing, mm -hmm. and then the Community Preservation Act coming in after them, followed by the scenic byway for their um, budget request, and then a joint discussion with Arlington 250, the scenic byway, and the Arlington Tourism and Economic Development Commission to talk about um, the semi centennial And um, so it'll be a very busy night. Huh? We've got Article 52, the uh, pension adjustment for former 25 year. Um, we vote that every year, a uh, sum of zero be appropriated. Um, this is to allow adjustments in case um, people who uh, retire and then a certain number of years afterwards that their old jobs are now paying more, are paying 50%. Um, they would fall below 50% of what their current job would pay. And this would allow the retirement board um, to make adjustments. We've never had to appropriate money, but this is a place to do it. So um, or and, and they also have to have 25 years of service. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, Second. So we're moving zero. Zero. Um, does everyone understand what we're doing with Article 52? Yes. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm going to abstain. All right. Raise your hand if in the affirmative. One, two, seven, nine, ten, fifteen. Any affirmative? Any opposed? Abstain. One abstention. So is it fifteen zero one? Yeah. Could we uh, the Harry Barber Community Service Article fifty one vote no action on the grounds that we're going to put the money in the uh, communities com and mm -hmm. committees and commissions? We already voted fifty one. Oh, we did. Okay. Yeah. Did we vote the Harry Barber Commission? Uh, no, because no. they they have the tech club, the tech right. outside right. stuff. Yeah. So, do we have any more information? Yeah. Um, the Human Rights Commission, their request for ten thousand. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alan, I. Where, where are we? Yeah. Human right. rights. I, I sent you a. Did you no. send me another update? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have. Well, I've been working all day. No. What, what questions that I was going to? Yeah, but then I sent you a reply, didn't I? I didn't see that. So we're not no. ready. All right. So we're not ready. Right. So maybe we can be ready uh, Wednesday night with that. What about Article 55? The library? We are not ready to deal with that. Okay. Yeah, Friday. I thought it's Friday. 
Sí. Um, I think that's all we will do tonight. All right. What? We have two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> who, who thinks we should use the minimum students? Put the H back for our schools, etc. <laughs> <laughs> really need HVAC people, so it's good. Good getting some people right. Oh, she goes out of the building. Turn. Oh, you're driving me down. Bye. 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 Bye